The following is a quote from our next speaker. Get as offended as you like. Needless to say, he tells it like it is. And I have the absolutely amazing privilege to have been randomly, synchronistically introduced to this occult researcher, philosopher, esoteric genius. The story goes like this. I had some random Skype friend that I met who knows where, and he said, Bob, you do a podcast, you should include this guy, he's amazing, he's a local Philly guy. Next thing I know, what on earth is happening, episode one is up, and the rest is now history. Long story short, Mark Passio is someone who will stand up. He will be a pivotal part in the revolution against the powers that shouldn't be he is uniquely qualified to share with you insights based on his immense research. And he is guaranteed to do so with the passion that Passio can only really hit home with. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Passio. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That, that, that just really warms my heart. Thank you all for being here today as part of this phenomenal event. My presentation here today is entitled The Unholy Feminine, Neo-Feminism and the Satanic Epigenics Agenda. And this presentation may be difficult for many people here today to hear. Certainly will be difficult for people watching via the internet later after this conference has concluded. But nonetheless, it needs to be said. And I've kind of built my reputation sort of on the ability or the decision to come out and say some things that other people won't. And I'm going to do that here today. Before we begin, I have a few caveats for the listening and watching audience. You won't really be seeing or hearing anything new here today. That may come as a shock to some people. You know, some people may be encountering this information for the first time, but it doesn't really mean that it's new. It's been happening. It's been ongoing. Just because it hasn't been perceived yet doesn't mean that it hasn't actually been ongoing. So nothing in this presentation is new or uniquely mine. The old saying, there is nothing new under the sun, means that truth is objective and it is eternal. And reality remains reality whether or not it is recognized and accepted as reality. All I can do in giving a presentation of this kind is put it in a personalized framework and then apply my personal aesthetics to it. If you're easily offended, it's probably a good time to get out while the getting is good. <laughs> the exits are in the back, they're clearly marked. My presentation style is off, often extremely intense and at times even combative. I don't sugarcoat my words or my delivery. Some of you are very likely during this presentation to possibly become upset and angered based on things you're gonna hear me say, so be it. Let those emotions be felt and deal with them. The truth itself by its very nature is combative because it wages war against mind control. I don't present this information to be liked. I don't present it to be popular. I don't present it to make money or to make friends. I speak publicly because I recognize that in a time of such overwhelming ignorance and deception, the fact that I do understand such information regarding what is taking place in our world today 
places me in a position of moral obligation to communicate this information to other people in an attempt to help them to understand it and to do something about it, to take action. So get as offended as you like. Yeah. It's not gonna change the truth. Don't fall prey to emotional mind control. See, people make the fallacy of wanting to think with their emotions about what's true or not. It's a very slippery slope to go down. So every person who wishes to take away real value from this presentation should make a deliberate and conscious effort to do two things while watching it. You should set aside your personal perceptions of me as the presenter, a very difficult thing to do, admittedly. This includes things like you, how you think I look, dress, or sound, or my delivery style. Paying attention to such trivialities will detract your mental focus away from the information that I am presenting, and that is what is important, not me as the speaker. Be consciously aware of any impulses you may have to reject this information based solely upon your initial emotional reaction to it. It is a logical fallacy to gauge the truthfulness, the veracity of any information that you are encountering based upon how it makes you feel when you first hear it. In other words, ignore the information in this presentation today due to your own ego bullshit at your own peril because this agenda is real and happening and it affects all of us. Watch the whole thing, not in pieces. Watch the whole thing. This information is a tapestry, and in turn, it is a part of an even larger tapestry that includes all of the information that I cover as part of my work. It is meant to be taken in as a whole in its entirety. To gain maximum value from it, I recommend that you stay for the duration of both parts, tonight and tomorrow night. If you don't do that, you are most likely not to recognize the full pattern that is inherent to the tapestry that I'm trying to weave here. To gain maximum value regarding all of the information that I present, of course, visit my website, whatonearthishappening.com, and check out all of the video and all of the audio on that website. I have always been someone that has tried to listen to reason regardless of how uncomfortable it made me feel. The people that I have respected the most in life have told me hard truths that I did not want to hear and that at many times I was not prepared to hear or to listen to, but they said it anyway. Those are the kind of people that I respect and look up to. And another thing I'd just like to say is the old adage, if, it is be if I have seen further, it is because I have stood upon the shoulders of giants. I'm not the first person who has recognized this information or this agenda. I won't be the last. Uh, this is about a building on people's former work that they have taken the labor of love to put out there for others. I am not on any side except for the side of truth and freedom. This presentation isn't about taking sides. That's the side I'm on. Truth, freedom, those are my values. That's what I find important and indispensable in life. I'll take those over being liked any day. So let's get right into it. Introduction and definitions of the concepts that we'll be talking about in this presentation. This presentation is building upon my presentation from last year's Free Your Mind conference, which was called The Cult of Ultimate Evil, Order Followers, and the Destruction of the Sacred Feminine. And in that presentation, I explained how order followers in the police and the military are absolutely annihilating the dynamic of care in our society. And they are just eradicating it. And they are silencing people and stepping on their rights. And they are taking direct aim at heart-based intelligence. And they are putting it to death. So this presentation here today, you know, of course, while last year's presentation focused largely on men, 
who are the vast majority of the order followers of our society. Of course, there are women order followers as well. But to be honest, they're the strong arm of the New World Order control system, the dark New World Order control system. Uh, let's, let's be honest, that the, the order followers who are implementing that s slavery system are largely comprised of men, military and police, who actually do the violent behaviors that they're ordered to do. This year, I'm shifting the focus and I'm talking about the destruction of the sacred feminine, specifically within women, within females in our society. And this is no less deadly to the dynamic of care in our society, which could act as the creative and cohesive glue between people that helps them to awaken and to change the world for the better. Unfortunately, this agenda I'm gonna be talking about is shutting down the dynamic of care in many women. I call this agenda, the, the neo-feminism agenda, the elephant in the room. It's, it's so big and it's actually so obvious that it acts like this old adage, there's an elephant in the room and nobody notices. And it's because a lot of people don't want to hear this. They don't want to talk about it. It's uncomfortable information. It's information that people really cringe at bringing it up because of how touchy some of the topics in this are. Uh, you know, this quote here, it's funny how everybody considers honesty a virtue and yet no one wants to hear the truth. It's very difficult to hear painful truths, especially if they may apply somewhat in some ways to you yourself. This is a great quote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot unlearn the many lies that they have been conditioned to believe and seek out the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned to reject. I would add to that and say it's the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned by mind control to ignore. This information that I'm presenting here today isn't so much a culted. It is ignored because bringing it up to people can create very uncomfortable social situations for the person bringing it up. And that's why it remains largely unspoken. The information I'm going to be presenting is controversial. But what does the word controversial mean etymologically? The word controversial comes from the Latin adverb contra, meaning facing, face to face, or up against and the Latin verb versare, which means to change or to alter. So when we put those together, the word controversial, literally in its root meaning, its root origin, means coming face to face with change, having to deal or having to confront the prospect of changing yourself. That's why things are often controversial. You cannot change what you refuse to confront. You will never create lasting positive change by running away or not facing something that needs to be faced and dealt with. I would not be willing to potentially alienate a significantly large portion of my entire listening audience by talking about this topic, this controversial topic of neo-feminism, if it were not real and critically important for us to understand. I am the furthest thing from a misogynist, and anyone who knows me personally will testify to that fact. I do not have hatred in my heart toward women. I will not make blanket statements here today in this presentation about, quote, all women. I will, however, during this presentation, be speaking in generalizations about most women or the vast majority of women. And here's a very important point to really take note of. It will be very important to note that even when I do use the term women in this presentation, I am referring to what I call the inauthentic woman or the conditioned woman or the mind controlled woman or the socially engineered woman. And when I say men, I'm also largely referring to the inauthentic man the socially conditioned man, the socially engineered man. And these are concepts that I will explore later in the presentation, the inauthentic woman and the inauthentic man. So just keep that in mind. 
all feminism is not equal. There is a world of division, a world divide, a world of separation between classical feminism and what I term neo-feminism. Now, other people have used the term neo-feminism, okay? And I want to just say, I am using neo-feminism in a specific context here today, which I'm going to talk about and define. You know, these are two images that I think clearly depict the difference between what classical feminism represented, okay, votes for women, uh, and you know, that's misguided in its own way because you're picking your, your master or enslaver, but that's another, you know, that's another discussion. But, um, you know, and, and neo-feminism, which, you know, here's, here's a woman screaming into the camera set with the words, fuck your morals, printed on her chest, written on her chest, okay? You know, uh, you could clearly see the difference in consciousness between these, you know, types of individuals. So classical feminism had certain basic points that it, it desired for women. It wanted equality for both genders in natural human rights. And this, of course, is in keeping with natural law. Everyone, regardless of gender, race, color, ostensible religion, whatever, has exactly the same natural rights. No one has any more or less rights than anybody else under natural law. So, of course, everyone should be equal in, in natural human rights. I mean, this goes without saying. So, in that sense, I agree with the, the principles of classical feminism. Women should receive the same pay in the same job for the same work that they perform. Well, who shouldn't? Why should anybody discriminate with pay for work that is being done? If it's the same job and you're producing the same end result, of course you should be compensated similarly. Uh, there shouldn't be discrimination in that respect. I can get behind that concept. Uh, classical feminism believed that, you know, the gender should be equal in their rights and there should be no patriarchy or matriarchy in society. Men shouldn't be in control and dominate women and women shouldn't be in control and dominate men. They wanted cooperation between the genders. Again, another concept I can get behind completely. So in that sense, I could consider myself a classical feminist. I have no problem with any of those concepts. Now, neo-feminism, on the other hand, took things into a very skewed extremist mindset. It wants, in many ways, additional, quote, rights for women over men in today's contemporary society, which I cannot agree with or get behind because there are no special rights that any individual has over any other. We all have exactly the same natural rights. Neo-feminism often attempts to equate the genders in all aspects, in characteristics, capabilities, etc. Not just natural human rights. You know, being equal in rights doesn't mean we're the same and can all do the same things, okay? We all are unique individuals with, with different unique characteristics. So it's not about sameness. It, it should be about equality under rights, but not trying to equate everyone exactly, identically, and make them all the same. And neo-feminists, many of them, believe that matriarchy should replace the idea that they have in their mind that there is a currently entrenched patriarchy in our society. And I will address the fact that that is a myth, an illusion, and we don't have either one of those dynamics in our society today. This is what classical feminism looks like if I could give it an image, you know. And that's what neo-feminism looks like if I could give it an image in, in your mind. I wholeheartedly agree with the one on the left there, and you know, the one on the right, I think it takes things to a ridiculous extreme. <laughs> Neo-feminism, ladies and gentlemen, is an act of war. It is a program of social engineering, or mind control, which is spe specifically targeted at women in order to incite a war between the sexes in a divide and conquer strategy. The long-term goal of this manipulated war is to weaken both genders to such an extent that it becomes much easier for the entrenched ruling class to subjugate both men and women under their worldwide system of totalitarian control that they are currently well on their way to building and completing. They are waging a gender war against both men and women through the neo-feminist agenda. Why do this? Why a gender war? Lots of reasons. Most people are completely ignorant to the fact 
that the ongoing and largely undeclared gender war is actually an occult eugenics agenda. My intention in presenting this information is not to further divide the sexes, but to illustrate and expose this eugenics agenda, which is being implemented by dark occultists who, who seek to subvert the true natural order and replace that natural order with their twisted and depraved religion of slavery and death. The gender war is what is known as a dialectic manipulation. This is a divide and conquer mind control strategy that is employed by social engineers and mind controllers. So what is dialectics? What does dialectic mean? The word dialectic is derived from the Greek preposition dia, meaning through or by way of, by means of, and the Latin noun lectus, which means choice. So literally, dialectics is a methodology of control that works through choice by way of some people on one side of a divide taking a side and making a choice and, fought, and then taking action based on that and people on the other side of the issue or the divide making a choice and then acting upon that choice. It's like the political party system that we have in the United States and many other so-called free countries. It's really a one-party system, but they're giving you the illusion that it's a two-party system, and they're ultimately taking, you, uh, taking everyone to the slaughterhouse regardless of which party they choose. So the dialectic in neo-feminism is largely between people who believe that there's a patriarchy and people who believe that there should be a matriarchy. And, you know, if you look at the words, what do they have in common? Archy, meaning rulership, control over other people, or in other words, slavery, from the Greek archon, which means master over a slave. You know, the other commonality here is uh, the control system itself, you know, to use a Game of Thrones analogy here. Great show, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't matter who's sitting on that throne. The concept to keep in mind here is there's a throne to be sat upon which needs to be destroyed and eradicated. And we need the concept of authority needs to, to go in our society. I always give this analogy to the situation. You know, people, a uh, lot of, you know, alternative historians and researchers want to say, well, war, World War II was a big manipulated war. Yes, it was. Of course, international bankers were involved in manipulating both sides. But here's the thing. Who did they really manipulate first? They manipulated the Axis powers and specifically the Nazis, got them all whipped into a religious fervor to wage war on the large portion of the European continent. So the question becomes, well, you know, how long do we let this manipulate, manipulated dialect go on for? You could make the claim, oh, well, they were all manipulated and under mind control, under a religious form of mind control called Nazism. Well. Does that change the difference in what they were actually getting done through their actions? You know, if somebody is performing great violence upon other people, do you say, oh my God, they're under mind control. I realize that they're totally, they're, they're falling for a dialectic manipulation and they're completely uh, manipulated and under mind control. So does that mean you just let their actions go on unchecked? You know, it's like the, it's like the current police state that we're dealing with in America. Well, everybody says, well, the police are just under mind control. They think what they're doing is right. They think they're just doing their jobs. Well, does that mean you just let them continue to stomp all over your rights for eternity? You know, and because you realize that they happen to be manipulated and under mind control, well, no action should be taken. Well, you're just going to let them do it. See, the concept to keep in mind here is both sides don't have to fall for the manipulation. Only one side of a dialectic needs to fall for the manipulation in order for the dialectic manipulation to be, be successful. Because they're, they believe in their minds that they have an enemy and they're waging war on that enemy already. So once one side buys into the dialectic, it's on. The war is on. The other side has one of two choices. They either have to convince the other side that they're under complete mind control and manipulation, and that other side has to be willing to listen to reason and change their behavior as a result, or there has to be a conflict. There has to be a choice that is made. People can be pulled into a dialectic legitimately. 
You know, I'll take fighting a war against people who are waging a war on freedom, even if I know they're under mind control. Doesn't matter. The end result is the same if freedom's gonna die. The end result is the same if freedom's gonna die. You know, so it doesn't make a difference if somebody has bought the manipulation. That doesn't excuse the behavior and mean that no, no action should be taken regarding it. So keep that in mind. That's how this gender war is being played off. And I'm not taking sides, but I am saying one of the sides is deeply buying into this gender war manipulation. And now they're getting the opposite effect in place where men are responding to that in very reactive ways, which I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. There is no bigger dialectic breakdown. There's no bigger dialectic divide than men versus women. There's no big, religion isn't a bigger divide. There's lots more religions. And it's, it's a, a skewed percentage. It's not a 50-50 percentage, you know? Um, political divides, you know? There's one party, another party, and there's people who don't buy into either, and then there's people who uh, follow, uh, you know, independent candidates, et cetera. There, that's not a 50-50 divide. There is no divide in humanity that is exactly 50-50. And the social engineers know that. That's why they specifically focused their efforts on cultivating this gender war because it's the only place where this 50-50 divide exists. And through it, they can create maximum social tension because the fabric of a society is the familial bond between man and woman. Make no mistake about that. That's why they're trying to wage this gender war create maximum divide and maximum social tension, instability, and chaos amongst people. This presentation is ultimately solution-oriented, and the solutions will be talked about tomorrow night. It is not presented to incite a further divide between men and women, as I've already said, but to promote awareness of the manipulation tactics being employed against both genders. The final part of this presentation will focus upon solutions that we can implement to heal the divide between the genders and to promote unified relationships. The neo-feminism agenda and the gender war that it is waging is a form of eugenics. Now, I know most of the people in this room know about eugenics, but a lot of the people that perhaps are listening to this information for the first time don't know about eugenics or what it is. The word eugenics is derived from the Greek adjective eugenes, meaning well-born, which is in turn derived from the Greek adjective eu, meaning good, and the Greek noun genos, meaning race or stock. Eugenics is a social ideology advocating the promotion of higher rates of sexual reproduction for people with traits and characteristics desired by its proponents and reduced rates of sexual reproduction and sterilization for those with undesired traits and characteristics. This practice could be described as a main religious tenet of the ruling class who believe that it is simply the quote unquote natural order for the most ruthless of humans whose genes in their minds are the quote fittest to rule the rest of the human herd they see themselves as a, quote, elite class of human beings who attained the highest positions of power in the world because they are genetically superior to those they rule over. Ultimately, this psychopathic ruling class believe that they have every right to decide who is allowed to live and procreate and who must die. You know, we've seen this ideology propagated in, in the past through wars and political agendas that really are an agenda of religious fervor, if you look much deeper into it. And what ultimately the religion that underlies eugenics is, is Satanism. The biggest form of eugenics that has, is being waged upon the human population right now, aside from the neo-feminism agenda, is abortion. I mean, it's, it's such a hardcore war that's being waged, especially against minority populations. I mean, over half of the African-American population's pregnancies in the United States end in abortion. More babies are being aborted than born. 
operations like Planned Parenthood are directly involved in eugenics. And many of the people involved in, in the boards of organizations like that make no bones about it, that they are eugenicists and they think the population needs to be culled. The dark occultists of this world are practically coming out in the open and telling people that they want to call them. You know, building monuments to eugenics as the Georgia Guidestones are. Right on the stones it says, maintain humanity under 500 million in what they think of as perpetual balance with nature. Now that's perpetual balance with a satanic mindset that there's an elite class that can consider themselves God on earth. That's what that is. That's an elimination of over 95% of the human population. And believe me, if they could get that done today, they would do it. And they're working toward it. I want to talk a little bit about something that Jay Parker talked about, which is epigenetics. And there's a lot of researchers that if you guys don't know about, I'm sure people in this room do, but a lot of people listening at home, they, they need to do the work and do the research and look into this topic because it's not only fascinating, it's critical to understand. The word epigenetics is derived from the Greek prefix epi, meaning beyond, further than, or past, and the Latin verb genere, which means to make or to create. So you put them together and it means beyond the genes, beyond cre the creative aspect. It's that which goes beyond our genes. Epigenetics is an emerging branch of science that takes human consciousness into direct consideration regarding the biological, psychological, and physiological expressions of human life and human society. The science of epigenetics clearly demonstrates that human beings possess the ability to create adaptive changes to their gene expressions via changes in consciousness. Genes have been proven to be only a tendency for biological expression. Since consciousness precedes the genetic expression in the physical domain, if consciousness is changed, then the gene expression in the physical domain can be fundamentally altered. In other words, can we actually alter our gene, genes and our genetic code through an alteration in our consciousness? And the answer is yes. This has been proven by this new emerging science. You know, I thought the word epigenetics had actually been scrubbed by mainstream media, but I shocked myself in doing some of the research for this presentation because I found that Time Magazine, of all publications, actually did a front story, a front uh, story piece on epigenetics in January of 2010. Epigenetics has shown that human beings are not controlled by genes like computer programs are controlled by computer code. This is a fallacy that is propagated by Darwinian scientism and the whole theory of evolution of the survival of the fittest or the most ruthless for almost two centuries. When we work to change our consciousness and our beliefs, our biological and psychological code can actually be rewritten and a different expression can be manifested. In other words, we are not our genetic code. That is not who we are. We are the writers of our genetic code. We are the authors of our genes. And they can be re-expressed if we re-express our consciousness. If fully grasped by humanity, this fundamental understanding could help us to radically transform our world for the better. And here are th just three, there's many others, but just three researchers who I feel take this science and put it into very easily understood terms that the, the layman, the non-scientist, can really deeply understand. And that is Dr. Bruce Lipton, who wrote the book, The Biology of Belief. Dr. Joe Dispenza, who wrote the book, Breaking the Habit of Healing Yourself. And Greg Braden, who wrote The Spontaneous Healing of Belief, among many others. I highly suggest the work. Now, let me qualify this as well. There's gonna be some other researchers that I'll talk about tomorrow that, you know, I don't have to agree with everything these guys think or talk about. 
I can put you onto some information that you have to be discerning about. You have to look at what is true and good and needs to be further explored in their research. And if they talk about some things that you don't fully agree with, well, then you have to use your own judgment and discernment. You have to let that go and weed out the inconsistencies. But I'm telling you their work on epigenetics is brilliant and it needs to be understood by humanity. Epigenetic eugenics. Okay, so now we're taking eugenics, the control over the population, into the epigenetic domain. Follow me here, okay? This is eugenics that is waged through the manipulation of consciousness. That is possible. It's not only possible, it's being done. What if an occult ruling class long ago discovered how to influence the breeding process within entire populations for the purpose of making those populations easier for them to control. In other words, controlling human breeding by manipulating human consciousness to get the characteristics of the next generation to come out the way the ruling class wants those characteristics to come out. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, human farming. Because that is what the control class, the social engineer class, consider themselves. They consider themselves farmers of the human herd of cattle. That's how they view us. That's how they view you. This is Population control through mind control. Population control waged through mind control. That's when we take the sugar coating off and call it what it really is. I have truncated or shortened these terms. Instead of calling it epigenetic eugenics, I refer to it as epigenetics. It's taking eugenics to the next level. Going beyond is what epi means when we put it in front as a prefix on a word. So we're going beyond classical physical eugenics that involve force, direct violence, and sterilization of human beings, okay? Now we're taking it into the epigenetic realm, the realm of consciousness and the realm of mind control and manipulation. Epi-eugenics is the propagation of eugenics by way of social engineering or mind control and selective breeding by the very population which the eugenics strategy is targeted to destroy. The people who the eugenics strategy is targeted to wean or to cull is actually performing this very selective breeding process. And they have been convinced that it is actually in their best interest to perform that calling upon themselves. And that's what's happening in our society, folks. That is going on actively as we're sitting here. Eugenics, epigenetics, one could call it mind-controlled downbreeding. Mind-controlled downbreeding. Or in other words, getting the human herd to call itself. That's what the social engineers of our world have actually accomplished, and I'm gonna explain how it works. It is very important to understand that eugenics is not just about population reduction. It is ultimately about controlling which characteristics are expressed in human society. By breeding certain desired characteristics into the gene pool, and breeding certain undesirable characteristics out of the gene pool. That's how eugenics is performed, okay? It's not just about killing off a bunch of people. It's if you want a society to go in a certain direction and you want certain characteristics in the members of that society, you have to influence the breeding of those characteristics and you have to influence the outbreeding of the characteristics you no longer want in it. The social engineers of our society, however, ladies and gentlemen, this may come as a big shock to you, are not 
actually eug eugenicists. They are not actually performing eugenics, okay? They are actually performing dysgenics. See, we shouldn't even be using the word eugenics to describe this process because it means good breeding. It means breeding strength into a society. It means upbreeding, making a society more strong and more cohesive and more dynamic and more diverse and just higher in consciousness in general than it used to be. That's not what the social engineers are trying to do. They're doing that to themselves, to their own subclass. Oh yeah, they're eugenicists for themselves, but not for us. You know, they're, they are waging a war of dysgenics, if the truth be told. They're creating people with horrible traits and characteristics through the manipulation of human biology and consciousness via chemicals in our food, water, and air, in addition to radionics fields that interfere with and change human physiology for the worse. I know Jay also discussed that in a big way yesterday as well. Our work overlaps a lot in this regard. Instead of eugenics and epigenetics, it would actually be much more accurate to refer to the strategies that I'm talking about of these social engineers as dysgenics and epidysgenics, respectively. Since these tactics are being used to weaken and destroy target populations instead of improving upon them. So really what we have is neo-feminism and the satanic epidysgenics agenda. That's what's really being waged against us. So that calls to question, when I say satanic epigenics or epidysgenics agenda, what are we talking about? What is Satanism? Now I know the people in this room from my work know what Satanism really is, but the vast majority of the human population still has absolutely zero idea what Satanism really is. They have an idea in their own mind of what they think it is, but the idea that's floating around in their own mind has nothing whatsoever to do what Satanism really is. And there are still people who want to tell me I'm not accurate about this and I don't know what Satanism is when I was a priest in this religion for almost a decade of my life. That's like walking up to a Catholic priest and saying, you know nothing about Catholicism. You went to seminary school. You're actually in the priest class of this religion. You know absolutely nothing about what it teaches or what's going on. You know, you would think you'd go up to somebody who is a clergy member of a particular religion if you wanted some information regarding the tenets or beliefs or practices of that religion, wouldn't you? You know, I was a clergy member of this religion, but I have no idea what it really is. Yeah. Satanism actually is an ancient occult religion comprised of diverse interconnected networks of worldwide adherence. At its ideological core, this religion postulates that knowledge of the human psyche and knowledge of the laws of the universe should be occulted and held only by a few human beings. It is much more accurate to perceive Satanists and dark occultists in general as ancient psychologists who hold and wield hidden information for the purpose of exploiting those who continue to remain ignorant of it. Through the power differential that this subclass of humanity gains by way of manipulating those who remain in ignorance of this occulted knowledge, this small minority who are in the know wish to permanently rule the masses of humanity and effectively become God on earth. It is important to understand that contrary to popular belief, the overwhelmingly vast majority of real Satanists do not worship an externalized deity known as Satan in the Christian tradition, but instead see Satanism as an ideological way of being in the world and view the ego-driven self as the quote-unquote God of their religion. They view themselves as God, folks. They're not worshiping any external deity. They're worshiping themselves, if you want to even word it that way. They're propping themselves up as God. That's what they want to be. They want to rule in a prison on a prison planet as the gods of that planet. That's what Satanism is. The symbolism and trappings of the Christian devil or Satan are used in modern Satanism for two main reasons. The first of these reasons is to try to make outsiders who know nothing about what Satanism really is see Satanism as quote, 
just another quaint religious belief that is based upon traditional Christian belief systems, which it absolutely has nothing to do with. The second reason for these trappings of the Christian devil uh, is to associate itself with the adversarial dynamic in nature, because that's what the word Satan means, as we'll see. Now, this adversarial dynamic in nature is referred to as involution in the occult world because it counters the force which drives consciousness forward, which is true evolution. The word Satan comes from the Hebrew word shatan, meaning adversary or opposer. Satanism is ultimately about being opposed to the true order of natural law, the universal laws of morality, which govern the behavioral consequences of beings who are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence and free will. They want to turn that natural law order on its head. So the bulk of the entire presentation over the next two days is going to be what I call the war against the goddess. Or what modern women are being socially engineered to think, to want, and to be, and the effects of that social engineering upon human society. Now, I will be giving this entire section, the war against the goddess, little over half of it today until the end of the presentation, and then the remainder I will pick up with tomorrow night, and then solutions will be presented at the end of the presentation tomorrow evening. Why specifically target women? Here's the main reasons that eugenicists and social engineers specifically have crafted these forms of mind control to target women in particular. Since women possess the capability of influencing men, and that is true, most women, uh, I'm sorry, most men will adjust their attitudes and behaviors to conform to women's likes and preferences. And the people sitting in this room here today know that that statement is true. And most people out, out there in the listening audience on the internet will recognize that statement as being valid. Therefore, if the ruling class can influence the minds of most women, the men and children of a society will ultimately follow. And folks, every totalitarian regime has known that truth and has adapted those principles to its twisted, twisted advantage. Additionally, women ultimately control, at a biological level, the human procreation process by way of their control over the selection of males with whom they choose to reproduce. Taking both of these factors into consideration, it is women who ultimately decide which traits and characteristics will be passed down to future generations of humanity. Now that's not taking epigenetics into account, but just genetically. Now, then you add all the epigenetic stuff, and if you have women under that epigenetic form of mind control, the manipulation of their consciousness, you're going to absolutely influence the characteristics that are going to be expressed at an epigenetic level as well. My question to everyone here in the listening audience today is, are your quote unquote likes truly your own? A very uncomfortable question to ask. What qualities do you find attractive in another person? Is it possible that such likes and preferences could be implanted into your belief system? It might surprise and even disturb most people to think that such aspects of their personality may not actually be their own. Most people don't even truly know why they find certain things attractive and others not. The same can be said for both men and women. Is all such attraction just a natural instinctive, instinctual dynamic? Or can a great portion of that kind of attraction be attributed to cultural programming? And I would suggest most certainly, it is the latter. There's a lot of cultural programming and engineering that goes into manipulating people's perceptions of what they find attractive or not. Edward Bernays, one of the leading social engineers of the last century, absolute Satanist, involved in the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, Chatham House, Wellington House, involved with Walter Lippmann, another huge eugenicist, you know, radically transformed for the worse, modern Western society, this mind controller and eugenicist, 
He said this, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism, this occulted mechanism of society, constitute an invisible government, in other words, a ruling class, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. And folks, he's not talking about the American so-called democratic society. He's talking about that's a logical progression of the way that the sick, twisted, social engineer, control freak ruling class is organized. And they're putting their religion into practice, which is eugenics. The inauthentic woman, this is very critical to keep in mind, this is what I'm talking about when I refer to women throughout this presentation. The inauthentic woman, or the socially engineered woman, is being above all else culturally conditioned to no longer be attracted to any of the qualities of an authentic man. Let me repeat that. The inauthentic woman is being conditioned in this Epi eugenics mind control agenda to not be attracted to the qualities of what I refer to in this presentation as a genuine man, an awake man, that's, that's the spiritual alpha, as I'm going to refer to it later in the presentation. Such qualities of the genuine man include high holistic intelligence, not just intellect, true confidence and high self-esteem, being very vocally opinionated, having very masculine features and an overall masculine look, independence, a rebellious attitude toward authority, and placing very high value on individual freedom. Such traits are, of course, and I would suggest that represents most of the males, the men in this room, genuine men, genuine, authentic men. However, of course, such traits are seen as highly dangerous to the goals of the ruling class, who wish especially to see society produce weakened men, since weakened, emasculated men, quote unquote men, are very unlikely to resist the state, while strong, independent thinking men are more likely to resist the control of the state. That's why they want to breed these qualities out of the human male. And that's why they want women specifically not to find those qualities attractive in a potential partner. When I say the authentic or the inauthentic man or woman, what am I talking about? So I've made this real simple breakdown chart of what I consider the authentic being versus the inauthentic being. The, all of the things that are listed in red are what I consider the inauthentic human, or what we can consider the beta class of humanity, which is the bulk of humanity. The bulk of humanity fits into those red squares, okay? Then there's the true alpha class of human beings, of male and female, okay? This is what I call the spiritually awake, the spiritual alpha female, the spiritual alpha male. So let's look at some of the qualities of these types of men and women. The beta female, and again, I put female in quotes here. It's not the genuine female. They are conditioned to submit to the dominator type so-called alpha males. Again, alpha is in quotes and male is in quotes. Because they're not the alpha and they're not true men. And we'll look at their characteristics, okay, in a moment. The, the alpha female is conditioned to desire either the dominator type alpha male or to control the submissive beta male who wants to be controlled by them. The beta male is conditioned to submit to the dominator type alpha female. 
the alpha male, so-called alpha male, okay, the non-genuine or inauthentic male, is conditioned to either desire the dominator type alpha female or to control the submissive beta female. Okay, so you see that the alpha male can basically cross over with the alpha female or the beta female. The alpha female can cross over with the beta uh, male or the alpha male. The all inauthentic types of human beings because they're all under mind control. And what is the next commonality? What are they all playing a game of? Control. control. Either to be controlled or to control someone else. They're in that mindset where they desire to be controlled or they desire to be in control of someone else. That's the quality that makes someone inherently inauthentic. The genuine woman or the spiritual alpha female, the true female, the true alpha female, is free of social engineering conditioning and does not play that control game, as does the genuine man or the spiritual alpha male. They're free of that social conditioning and they don't play the game of either wanting to control someone else or wanting to be controlled by someone else. Let's look at some of these programming tactics that are used against women. This is one I think just about everybody can see very openly because it's so blatant and we'll agree with. The inauthentic, it's called princess programming. That they start very early. They have to start with very, very, very young women when they're children. The inauthentic woman has been socially engineered from a very young age to want to be placated, revered, and pampered. Princess programming is huge in Western culture and starts at a very early age. Through this programming, young women are often taught, here's the list of things they're taught to do and to be like, to value only what can be gained for themselves through relationships with men. To seek only men who can quote unquote provide for them or quote unquote take care of them. And to quote marry well, to marry into money, etc. To place paramount importance on their own physical appearance to quote lure a male to devalue the importance of their own intelligence, to seek money as their main value system, and even to think that, quote unquote, no man is good enough for them. You'd be surprised how many people teach this kind of a value system to their daughters. It is going on continually in our society. Very powerful form of mind control. You know, that parents are actually propagating unknowingly. And they're doing it through the mass media and, and movies that project these values right into the subconscious mind of children as well. The primary motivational factor that women are taught to desire through this social engineering is security. This is the psychological dynamic that they are taught to crave from the minute they are out of the womb, practically, by the ruling class. The inauthentic woman is largely motivated by the psychological desire for attachment and security. To them, again, the inauthentic, socially engineered woman, love is seen as pr primarily as a form of permanence and attachment rather than a deep familial bond with another human being. Money and government are often perceived by them as assurances of comfort, prosperity, and long-term security. Again, this is a fear response. This is a fear tactic of manipulation based on scarcity mind control, scarcity-based mind control. The primary desire for financial security as a resource for safety can be most readily seen in our culture in the most frequently asked question by a woman to a man when first meeting, which is, what do you do for a living? I have now, independently as a social experiment, asked 107 people this question. 
107 people have answered the question the same way. The first, I asked, what is the first question after initial pleasantries are exchanged? That inevitably, invariably, a woman in our society will ask a, a, a man during their first encounter when they're first meeting. 107 out of 107 human beings immediately, like that, spit back the answer, what do you do for a living? Ladies and gentlemen, if I stood on the street corner outside this hotel tomorrow morning and asked 107 people on a cloudless, sunny day in an area of the sky where the sun is not shining, just if you look in the sky, what color does it refract? They would not answer blue. 107 people would not give the answer blue to that question. And I'm serious. You cannot get social agreement on a question on any question, that perfectly aligned on any topic. But that one you can. Why is that? It has nothing to do with mind control. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Ultimately, the desire for security is the desire for an illusion. There is no such thing as security, ladies and gentlemen. Doesn't exist now, never has existed, is never going to exist. A comet could be on the way to hit this planet in the next couple of days, and our ass would be grass. <laughs> and there wouldn't be a damn thing anybody would be able to do about it. You think you're secure on a planet, a physical planet, in, in a solar system going around a star? There's no security here. A cataclysm could happen any day. Ask people in, you know, Southeastern Asia, how secure they feel when an earthquake could hit the middle of, of the Pacific or the Indian Ocean at any time and create a massive tsunami. There's no security on this planet. There's no safety here. If you're ex expecting safety and living for safety and living se for security, you're already under mind control. You're already living in a dynamic of fear. As long as you live in a physical reality, there is danger and it has to be embraced and accepted. You cannot live life in fear. The search for security in a man with money or the desire to be simply, quote, taken care of by someone else is an integral part of the ego gratification, me, 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 satanic mindset. Very few want to see and admit the truth regarding this. Most will attribute this to Darwinian theory biological response, you know, this desire for security in a male. You know, trying to find the, the most fittest to propagate the genes to the next level. This is a whole so social Darwinism and, and physical Darwinism argument. When in fact this behavior is deeply ingrained social conditioning. Sadly, most people desire a state of safe and secure slavery as opposed to one of dangerous freedom and its associated personal responsibility. I'm not interested in safety, folks. I'm interested in freedom. I'm interested in my natural rights as a sovereign being. Most men are also in this manipulated mindset, unfortunately. The realization that death lurks around every corner is the state of reality that the authentic man and the authentic woman live in at all times. And they embrace that. They know that no one knows when it's their time. You don't live your life thinking about that. You live your life focused on what you want to do and trying to do the right thing and trying to build, build yourself up and help to build others up. If you live like that, you're living an authentic life. The mind control program attempts to get the inauthentic woman to equate money with genuine value, to have money as the principal basis of their value system. The inauthentic woman is socially engineered to perceive money as the primary value system in human life. This general mindset postulates that something is only worth doing if money is being made by doing it. In reality, nothing could be further from truth. This is one of the primary reasons that art, music, poetry, and especially 
philosophy are so drastically de-emphasized in modern society and even frowned upon by many people as something that you choose to do only if you quote unquote want to starve, you know? How many people take that mindset? They think the only value in anything is if money could be acquired by doing it. This leads to the concept in neo-feminism known as hypergamy, which means marrying well or marrying up, marrying the man with the most resources, the biggest bank account, the most comfortable lifestyle. When the inauthentic woman meets a man for the first time, the first and foremost question that she asks is, what do you do for a living? Why is it not, do you know the difference between right and wrong behavior? Can anybody answer that question? I'd like an answer to it personally. That should be the first question a human being asked to another person they're meeting for the first time. Do you know the difference between right and wrong? That's what I'm concerned about. That's what I want to make sure you have a deep, full, fundamental grasp of when I'm building a relationship with you. I'm not interested in what you do to make fake ass Federal Reserve notes that aren't worth the paper they're printed on. No, man, I have friends I don't know what they do for a job. I honestly have friends I don't know what they do for a job. And I don't care, and I don't even need to ask them that question. As long as they're not doing something completely immoral that's coercive toward other people's rights, I don't care. Hypergamy, or marrying upward, is a learned behavior, a socially engineered behavior that is entirely about the search for security in a man with a high monetary income. You know, some of these images here could be a little incendiary or inflammatory. Hey, so be it. This is going on out there in society. The, the image to the uh, left, to the bottom left says, if we're going to date, I need to know your credit score, how much money you have in the bank, and if you're vaccinated. <laughs> Meanwhile, notice this guy is a complete psychopath with a big knife behind his back. You know, she's not interested in, you know, whether he's a good guy. She wants to know all this other stuff about his, you know, his finance. The one on the bottom right says, this guy wins $181 million in the lottery on Wednesday and then finds the love of his life just two days later. Talk about luck. <laughs> you know, I mean, get as offended as you like, folks. Stuff like that goes on all the time in our society, all the time. Here's a video that kind of describes what her hypergamy is. I got a kick out of this one, but I'll tell you what, it's more prevalent, it's more out there than anyone would be comfortable believing. Let's watch this. Hey, what's up? Hi. You're pretty cute. Uh, wanna hang out sometime? Uh, no, I don't know. I'm here. I'm just new here, so I just wanna see, you know, you can chill, hang out or something. You do? Yeah. I mean, we can just be friends, you know, it doesn't have to go. Uh, it's kind of serious, I don't think it's good, yeah. Nothing? I give my number out to people I don't know, sorry. You sure? Yeah. All right, well. Bye. We got a million dollar deal going on on Thursday. We can't screw this up, trust me. Yeah, no, it's a simple. About 48 million we're looking at. All right, let me call you back. All right, bye. Hi, how's it going? Hi, good. Are you, um, are you sitting here alone? Yeah, I am. Mind if I join you? Yeah, I You don't have to have a boyfriend or anything when you're trying to see you. What do you got going on later on tonight? I'm not doing anything. What are you up to? Um, nothing. It's my, I don't have any plans tonight. I was wondering maybe you wanted to get a drink. Yeah, that sounds good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, why don't we, oh, actually, um, I'm here meeting up with my boss. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm here to give him this car. Here you go, boss. I wash your car. You a jacket? Got your jacket in the car. All right. Would you like me to clean? Yeah. Why? Why? Why, why does it matter? Doesn't matter. So you still want to grab a drink or? 
Yeah. Wait, so do you have a boyfriend or you don't? No, it's not that serious. I guess we could hang out maybe like 10, 15 minutes ago. Yeah, you want to <laughs> But I hate liars and gold diggers. <laughs> You know, I mean, this legitimately does go on. I wish it weren't so. You know, I, look, I, I wish a lot of what I'm talking about here in this presentation weren't so. I don't want it to be this way, you know? When I talk about this with people, even in my personal life, it's like, it's, they don't even respond with, with hatred to what's going on. They respond with disappointment. That's really the dynamic that I feel. That's the, that's, the, that's the energy that I feel when I think about this type of stuff. Because I realize what the true potential could be for our species versus what we're really doing and the kind of values that we're really holding. And um, you know, I, get, I get disappointed about it. The rampant consumerism that is taught to the inauthentic woman. The inauthentic women largely drive the world's corporate economy being responsible for over 85% of total purchases of all goods and services according to corporate and consumer advocacy studies. This is not only well past the natural expected median, but it is ridiculously skewed. I mean, you would think that, you know, men and women basically, you know, use equal amounts of resources. And so, you know, you would pr pretty much see a 50-50 median distribution distributed on a, a dynamic like that, but you don't. 85 to 15, I mean, that's unnaturally skewed. This is not only well past the natural expected medium, but it's ridiculously skewed, and it shows just how much corporate advertising is completely geared toward the manipulation of women. It also shows their purchasing power and their power to influence entire societal trends. I would say for the worse, or if they choose to step into their true power, they can influence things for the better societally. Yeah. Equality versus sameness. The neo-feminist agenda continually reinforces the notion that women are the same as men, not just having equal rights as men, but the same in characteristics and abilities as well. This was one of the main techniques used to influence women to join the corporate workforce, which removed them from their traditional roles as nurturers of the young. Children were then largely turned over to state-run indoctrination, the state-run indoctrination system of public schooling, in order to shape their beliefs and destroy their health and morals. Abandonment issues were also created when children were put into public schooling through parents being absent, both parents in the workforce being absent from the, the children, during the 15,000 hours of compulsory schooling that children are made to endure in Western culture. You know, the, the state ends up being the nanny or the mother figure or the father figure, you know, because of this. It's, it's a, a side effect, you know, of the whole agenda to bring women into the working, corporate working world. Not to say that, you know, women shouldn't have careers. I'm just saying there was an alternative agenda. There was an alternative motive at work when this was done. Beyond the conditioned woman is being socially engineered to love the state. This is what I call the unholy matrimony between women and governments. They're being engineered to love the state for the small, tiny perks that they are given by it. On a subconscious level, they've bought into the state as a protective father figure. And this itself is an expression of a parental abandonment issue or perhaps not having a strong father figure during their formative years. Emotional, spiritual, and sexual connections between men and women are being eroded and may be eventually eradicated by the state. The state continually positions itself to be psychologically accepted, especially by the inauthentic woman, as the provider the protector, and the husband. The vast majority of women in our society, unfortunately, will not speak out against the state.
for these very reasons. And ladies and gentlemen, I just have to be honest myself. I mean, when I look at political rallies, it is so skewed. It's nowhere near a 50-50 distribution in mainstream politics where people are trying to vote for a master. I mean, it's like over 75, 20, it's over three quarters to one quarter female to male distribution, at least, just by my own cursory um, you know, assessment of, of the, the, the numbers involved. Why would so many women be directly involved in the, the process, the governmental process to pick a new slave master? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a sad thing, but I have to point it out. You know, just like the, the, the numbers in a place like this are pretty equal, very equal, just looking at the audience, you know? Um, because these are, we're highly conscious people who are aware of a lot of these agendas. But I mean, in general, in the movement, to just even have less government in our lives. Again, it's a very skewed thing where it's largely men, and I would say it's a probably an eight or nine to one ratio in what I would call the freedom movement or what I would personally call the my freedom movement, as I talk about. I don't think we have a true freedom movement built yet. I think this is a start of one here at the Free Your Mind conferences and events, but um, I think people you know, who want less government want it want it that way for largely selfish reasons still. And they're not thinking about it from a very philosophical and moral level as such yet. It's slowly building to get into those philosophical principles, but I think it has a long way to go. But even within that movement, like it's a ridiculously skewed ratio. And you, you would hope to see a more even gender distribution, but it's largely, uh, the, the status distribution is largely toward women and the uh, you know, freedom-minded distribution is largely toward men, overall in society. Marriage, divorce, and divorce courts. The formal institution of marriage, as sanctioned by the state and religion, of course, is often favored by the conditioned woman, since it brings a personal relationship into union with the violence of the state, which can be used to control men. And this has been traditionally used and steered to the benefit of the female, especially when a marriage ends in divorce. 80% of all divorces are initiated by women, mostly because real world men don't live up to their pre-programmed expectations. Divorce courts rule drastically in favor of women over 95% of the time. 95% of divorce court rulings are awarded to women in our society. Divorce rates will predictably continue to rise astronomically in our society as long as conditioned women remain attached to the types of unrealistic cultural expectations they have regarding relationships, regarding male-female relationships. These expectations are part of the quote-unquote no man is good enough for me princess programming. Money and the maintenance of lifestyle is almost always valued above emotions, feelings, and moral issues in modern relationships. Such a system is institutionally structured to break down the strength of both genders and therefore negatively impact future generations, meaning the children who are born out of these relationships. Attractiveness studies. One of the most interesting dynamics that I've come across in all of my research Studies that have been conducted to appraise men and women's perceived attraction show that men are attracted to a far greater number of body types and overall physical features than women. Women, I'm sorry, when shown thousands of images of females with very diverse sets of physical characteristics, the average amount of women that in this group of thousands that men perceived as physically attractive was approximately 80%. Eight out of 10 were said to be acceptably physically attractive by the, uh, by the man regarding the thousands of images of women that they were shown in, this, in these studies. And this is a repeated, repeated result in many different attractiveness studies. Women, however, when shown thousands of images of males with also very diverse sets of physical characteristics, were attracted to an average of less than 20% of men. Actually, the, the number is approximately 18%. Okay, 
Now, if you look at the bell curve, and I hope it shows up okay on the slide, I hope you can see it, because it's sort of a thin line, maybe I should have highlighted it a little bit better. Look at the bell curve distribution. What, what you're seeing there is the number on the left, and the axis on, on the bottom there is um, when, who was rated least attractive and who was rated most attractive. Look at the perfect bell curve distribution of ma male appraisals of female attractiveness. It is the classic bell curve distribution. It can almost not even be more perfectly bell-shaped, okay? Now look at the shape of the curve when it comes to female appraisals of male attractiveness. That spike means that the vast majority of men, that spike up on the left-hand side means the vast majority of men that these, that the women who were, who con they conducted these studies upon, found so many men unacceptably attractive. They rated them the least attractive. It's not, the, the, the median is not even in medium attractiveness. It's all the way skewed to completely unattractive. <laughs> and then on the right hand side, you see only a very, 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 very tiny fraction of men were perceived by women as very attractive. There is no one can possibly convince me that this is a naturally occurring phenomenon. No information that I could possibly be presented will convince me that that is a normal part of nature because nature doesn't do those things. Nature creates curves. Nature doesn't work in straight lines like that, okay? You are not going to see a non-natural distribution like that as part of something that happens naturally. That's social engineering. Such attractiveness studies demonstrate that women have an extremely limited range of characteristics which they find attractive in men. The drastic difference in the bell curve on these studies shows the blatantly skewed and unnatural divergence in women's preferences versus the smooth and naturally occurring median curve of men's preferences. The men's results show a natural selective preference, while the women's results display an artificially inflated selectivity that is indicative of social engineer, socially engineered perceptions. Of course, many people will incorrectly attribute this divergence to the old, tired Darwinian scientism explanation that this is all about evolution and survival of the fittest and men can produce an unlimited amount of sperm while women can only produce one egg a month and have to be super selective about who they, they, they mate with, etc. And this is, you know, absolute bunk nonsense as far as I'm concerned, okay? I mean, again, nature doesn't produce results like that. Social engineering does. Now, here's something that may be new that very few people are willing to talk about, okay? How many people have seen my cosmic abandonment presentation by a show of hands? Okay. L probably less than half the room, but maybe about 50-50. Height. So this, is, this section is called Anunnaki programming. Does size really matter? Height is one of the top factors in the minds of programmed women when it comes to desires in male physical characteristics, or any characteristics for that matter. Why should this necessarily be so? Are taller men more moral? Are taller men more intelligent? Are taller men even more skillful than shorter men? The answer is that people perceive height as powerful and therefore desirable. This fact can be observed readily in the height of politicians, the height of CEOs, and other people in positions of power throughout our society. But my question to that is, why should that dynamic even be so? Should height make anyone more qualified for a leadership position? Is height going to increase my skill to perform my, the set of skills that I need to perform my job? If I'm taller, am I gonna suddenly magically do my job better? You know, maybe if it involves reaching things that are what, you know, much higher than I. But aside from that, you know, you know, maybe reach if you're involved in martial arts or boxing, reach comes into play. But, you know, aside from things like that, you know, height 
does not make a person truly a better human being. Look at the average height, of, I mean, look at average heights of politicians, 6'5", 6'3", 6'3", 6'3", 6'1", 6'1", and on and on. It's almost like, forget about getting elected by the mind control public if you're under six feet tall. You know, it's not gonna happen, apparently, because you're just a better leader if you're t farther away from the ground, I guess. The number one att attractiveness characteristic repeatedly listed by most women in all attractiveness studies as desirable in a potential male partner is repeatedly and consistently demonstrated to be height. In many cases, a man's true moral value system is considered by women only as a secondary factor, if at all. Almost all women on modern online dating sites insist upon knowing a man's height prior to meeting with him in person. Most women will even post their own height on the dating site, as they perceive height as so important that many of them actually believe that men are as obsessed about it as they are. I mean, how many men, how many men, single men out in the audience go into a dating site and go, oh my God, I gotta know how tall this woman is. Like, please tell me your height immediately. How many? Does anybody here, would that be one of the first things they would ask a woman on a dating site? I guarantee you not one in the room. Not a single one in the room. So what is the obsession with this? And you know, something else I discovered very coincidentally by studying this dynamic and, and seeing this repeatedly demonstrated online in online forums is there's a bitter hatred, a bitter, bitter hatred by tall women for shorter women. A bitter hatred. Tall women hate short women. Over and over again, I see that this, this vitriol, this viciousness displayed on forums by tall women to short women because they say, how dare you date the tall men? How dare you take the tall men away from us? We need the, the tall men. You have no right to them. We're taller than you. We have a right to those tall men. I swear, I'm not, even, I'm not making it up. This is an actual quote from a forum. I hate when short girls date tall guys. Us tall girls need them instead. I mean, what, is, what is this about? While most socially engineered women will claim that they would prefer as a potential partner a man who is six feet or taller, six feet tall or taller, listen to this statistic, ladies and gentlemen, especially ladies, the actual percentage of males in the total human population that are six feet zero inches or taller is exactly 12%. 12% of the human population, 88% of the entire male population is less than six feet zero inches tall on planet Earth. So just think about that as a eugenics strategy. To condition women to only want that 12% of the population, largely, not all of them, okay, not speaking in blanket statements here, you are already controlling the population right there. The world height average, the only country on earth, the only country on earth that has an average height of six feet, and it is exactly six feet zero inches, is the country of Norway. No other country on earth has an average height of six feet for men. And I'll tell you what, that's directly because of the Anunnaki. That is directly because of the information that I talk about in cosmic abandonment. We're talking about the tall blonde people, okay? That's why that those genetics are prevalent in that country. So the question looms, why exactly do women, women place such staggering importance upon male height, a factor that does not make any man more moral, more intelligent, more skillful, or even necessarily physically stronger than males of average or below average height? Tell you what, some men who are shorter are built like pit bulls, low center of gravity, low to the ground, and can be even much more uh, vicious and, and physically dominating than taller men. Once again, 
the Darwinists will, will come out of the woodwork and trot out their tired and boring survival of the fittest nonsense to explain this. And that it doesn't hold any water because again, I mean, hey, with, with, with a sidearm, it don't matter how big you are, okay? Even with weapons of the past, some of the, the, the best warriors were that, that smaller, short status squat pit bull type men. You know, so it doesn't even make you physically stronger in most cases. In some cases it does. So why? Well, the true answer will require much more research and a total reevaluation of human history from the version of history that we have all been conditioned to accept. And people should see my cosmic abandonment presentation for more information on these occulted topics. The bottom line, folks, the Anunnaki, who were the beings that created humanity and who we considered gods for hundreds of thousands of years, who gave us our systems of religion, government, and money, and at times ruled over us with unquestioned, ruthless power and with technology that seemed completely supernatural to us, were an average of nine feet tall. An average of nine feet tall. You know what? That's all still completely intertwined in our ancestral DNA and our ancestral memory. That's why most people consider height a factor in leadership and in attraction and in the ability to, to, to do things in, as a, a preference that should be desired. It has nothing to do with any kind of better survival mechanism. It has to do with the beings that already were in positions of power and influence on this world for hundreds of thousands of years were over nine feet tall. Even today, people still associate height with power for this very reason, especially the conditioned woman, who's traditionally tended to flock to the men who controlled the most resources, since that would lead to a more comfortable way of life for them. And that is exactly why women also directly inbred with these beings. Oh, by the way, let me just go back to that slide. By the way, folks, Take a look at some of these images, okay? From Sumer on the left there, the god Enki presiding on his throne above other small human beings. I mean, a being like that would be over 12 feet tall, most likely. Look at, uh, in from out of Egypt, a tall being. You know, there's nothing allegorical being portrayed here, people. He's holding three human beings by their hair. You wanna give me an allegory to explain that one? That's how strong they were, too. They could snap a human neck like a small twig. Watch the new movie, Gods of Egypt. You'll see the Anunnaki in action in that movie, also portrayed as shapeshifters. The appearance of confidence, false appearance of confidence in society. The conditioned woman generally ends up in unfulfilled relationships even after finding a, quote, man with the qualities she believed she wanted. The reason for this is that the qualities such conditioned women were programmed to desire at a subconscious level are almost always in direct opposition to what they genuinely, deep in the core of their being, desired and, and wanted and needed. This dynamic also works in reverse. A good example of how it works in reverse is the conditioning that inauthentic women receive to desire so-called confidence, and I put that in quotes, quote-unquote confidence in a man. Yet when they encounter men, when the inauthentic or the conditioned woman in our culture actually encounters men who possess true male confidence, they will often attempt to break down that confidence, to rip it down to ridicule that man and to call them know-it-alls. What such women have actually been conditioned to do, to want, is the illusion of confidence in a man. Yet when they actually encounter true male confidence in a man, they want to run away from the real thing. The hypersexualization of women in our culture and slut-shaming. Now, women, 
are hypersexualized in mass media, in advertising, and in pornography. Yet they are actively discouraged in our society from having healthy sex lives. And this encouragement for them you know, not to have sex, not to have healthy sexual lives, ha happens through the neo-feminist technique known as slut shaming. It's very prominent, very prevalent in society. They use this form of social fear as a method of control through media and pop culture. And the, the fear is an ongoing thing to get their peers to ridicule them. This is done with women and men. Women see other women who are, have healthy sexual lives and they say, you're a slut, you're giving it away. Well, when you can get, you know, get something in return. You know, it's not about the shared interaction, the shared familial dynamic between man and woman. You know, that is about, you know, building bonds and experiencing pleasure and joy. You know, it's about, what well, can I get for it? You know, and this is reinforced by men too. You know, men see women with a healthy sexual libido and say, oh, a slut, or it's unde she's undesirable because she's had too many partners. You know, uh, this is absolute, like a neo-puritanical view of sex that is still so prevalent in our society because of religious indoctrination that is still very prevalent in our society. Here's a great quote from an anonymous person on a message board that I encountered when looking up the concept of slut shaming, okay? It says, he said, I th he or she said, I think the reason most women have unhealthy sexual lives is because they are trained to hate sex. When I was in school, our sex education classes actually taught us that sex was risky, that quote unquote good girls withhold and avoid sex at all costs, that men only want to use women for sex, and therefore we should be suspicious of all sexual interests, that sex will hurt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is still the very strong idea that women who like and want sex are slutty and undesirable. And then there are the women who learn to hate sex so much that they actually never experience orgasm, meaning that even when they do have sex, they do not enjoy it, and so they eventually avoid it altogether. Ladies and gentlemen, the disturbing statistic that is reality is that over half of women never experience orgasm during a sexual experience with men. Over half. Not under, like not right, even right at half. More than half. I just want to go back real quickly, if I may, to this other image. You know, look at all the things that women are called. You know, if they have a healthy libido. Easy, fast. Whore, dirty, slut, sex kit, loose, floozy, skank, hoe, wench, tramp, asking for it, sleeping around, hooker, siren, prostitute. That's what most people think just the person with a healthy libido is. A woman with a, sex, with a healthy sex life, a healthy libido is. I mean, it's a, that's a disgrace that someone should endure being, you know, called things like that. And women do it to other women. Um, the dynamic of sex as money. To the manipulated woman, sex has largely become a form of commerce in our society, sadly. A business transaction. That's what the actual magical experience, the shared magical experience between man and woman of sex has become in a lot of women's minds, a lot of manipulated women's minds, a business transaction. The desire for money has become completely tied up and twisted into the motivation for any type of sexual relationship between man and woman. The mindset goes something like this. If I have sex with this man, what resources can I continue to get from him long term? Men chase so hard after money for this very reason. Again, the manipulated man. They chase that money to attract women who want that money. Both genders still continue to prop up money as the most powerful religious belief system on the face of the earth. And make no, no mistake about it, folks, that's what the monetary system is. It is the religion of the bulk of this, the people on this planet. A great deal of socially engineered women have come to generally accept that sex, from a man's point of view, is just the same whether it is part of an intimate relationship 
or whether he is paying a call girl or a prostitute for it, believing that since the biological act is the same, they carry equal value in a man's mind. The prostitute has something that he wants, so just exchange money for it like a business transaction. The free will, voluntary and mutual exchange of emotions and physicality as part of the genuine human sexual experience is not alike to quote unquote paying for it in any way whatsoever. And the genuine man and the genuine woman knows this. The socially conditioned woman will often largely discount male emotions with a shallow view, which is actually a form of misandry, which I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. Many social, sex has a means of control by the inauthentic or culturally conditioned woman. Many socially engineered women have been conditioned that it is perfectly acceptable to use sexuality as a means of manipulating and controlling men to get them to do what they want and to give them the resources that they desire in exchange for sex or even just for the promise of sex, dangling it over their head. While one could claim that this is not technically immoral behavior, since it is voluntarily complied with on the part of many men, it is certainly a very low consciousness view of human sexuality and a low consciousness view of the exchange of energy in human relationships. Again, I'm not saying there should be no prostitution or anything like that. I think, hey, if it's voluntary, do it. I'm not saying there should be rampant promiscuity in our society either, okay? Uh, you know, I'm just saying, while this is a, a voluntary, um, you know, exchange, it, look at how much it, it actually diminishes the real value of the genuine thing, which can be transformative. You know, people think about sex because it is a powerful transformative form of energy exchange, you know? And look at how it's being used. The satanic mindset, this is all part of the satanic mindset. The satanic mindset plays a major role in the psychology of neo-feminism. Many neo-feminists openly claim that they identify with the ideology of Satanism. The first tenet of the satanic ideology is the dictum that, quote, self-preservation is the highest law. Put in other words, the survival and comfort of the physical self is always, more import, um, always a more important goal than doing what is morally right. Live only for yourself and care only about you and yours. If you must step on others to get what you want, then so be it, for this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Ladies and gentlemen, above all else, that's what Satanism is. Above all else, that's what Satanism is. And most people have no idea that not only is that what Satanism is, but that they're in that mindset, that they are living as a Satanist. The ideologies that clearly define the overarching worldview of Satanism is perpetual me, me, me thinking, ego gratification, hedonism, and always wanting to be in control of other people. Would you agree that the vast majority of the individuals in our society subscribe to such a satanic worldview? I know I would. You know, I call their worldview mini-me Satanism. You know, you can look at the real dark occultists who know this openly as Dr. Evil, who are sit sitting on the Iron Throne or desire to sit on the Iron Throne. But the population is many me who are molded to be like them and to want power over other people in the same respect that the, the real controllers of our planet want and desire power at all times and places. The dominator or doormat syndrome. What has now become attractive to the socially conditioned, the socially engineered woman, is the inauthentic alpha male who acts as the dominator or the controller, okay, the dominator, or the inauthentic beta male who is the doormat or who seeks to be controlled, what many people in the MIGTO movement refer to as the mangina. <laughs> the inauthentic woman now desires the corporate cosmo man, the metrosexual, the androgynous hipster, the inauthentic man of every kind. Men also fall for this programming through TV, movies, mainstream media, magazines, and popular music, and seek to become what the conditioned woman is attracted to. 
i.e. the dominator or the doormat. Again, playing the game of control, either w wanting to be controlled by someone else or wanting to control someone else. The war on testosterone. A biological war on testosterone is being waged on both men and women by the social engineers. Testosterone is a vital hormone for the physiological and psychological health of both men and women. It could be seen as the will hormone or the drive hormone. Low testosterone levels in either gender ultimately destroy vitality and normal human sex drive, and it acts as a means of population control and eugenics when testosterone is destroyed in men and women. If the testosterone level of a male is too low, sex drive is significantly diminished and overall vitality and masculine traits are greatly reduced. In other words, over time, the human male will become feminized with a lack of proper testosterone levels. The influence of testosterone on the human male, growth of facial hair, growth of body hair, supports collagen, sperm production, prostate growth, erectile function, uh, muscle mass, strength, sex drive, positive feelings, aids cognition, aids memory, red blood cell production, bone density maintenance. Just about every form of strength and vitality that can be produced by the human body is supported by the hormone testosterone in a male. Women also require testosterone, although in smaller amounts than men. If lacking in this hormone, women become over-feminized, depressed, weaker in overall strength and vitality, and their sex drive is usually completely destroyed. Symptoms of low testosterone in women, poor tolerance for exercise, dry skin, thinning skin, loss of motivation, loss of muscle tone, loss of bone density, weight gain around the abdomen, depression, anxiety. Common symptoms, anxiety, mood swings, hot flashes, low sex drive, and accumulation of fat. One of the things that keeps testosterone levels normalized is a healthy libido. It's a cycle. One thing drives the other thing. Across the board, modern medical doctors have seen a disturbing trend of testosterone levels plummeting significantly for both genders. This is no accident. Instead of alerting people to this fact and trying to understand why this is happening, modern doctors have been deliberately reducing the levels of testosterone that are considered normal for both genders in medical testing and literature. The war on human sexuality is being waged through the war on testosterone in our society in both males and females. The methods of attack, putting people through absolute rat wheel work environments. You know, stress, food, GMO food, the pesticides in food, the hormones in dairy and meat, alcohol and drug consumption, fluoride in the drinking water, BPA in the plastics, SSRI drugs, what I call the demon drugs, totally destroy testosterone levels. Cell phone radiation, cell tower radiation, chemtrails, radionics through things like HARP, mind control through the television, the mass media, skewing the perceptions of men and women, the feminization of men, you know, destroying sex drive through pornography as well, or manipulating sexual preferences through pornography. The destruction of the familial dynamic is what this is all leading to. The attack upon the natural sexual familial dynamic in society tremendously destabilizes the ability for people to establish firm foundations in relationships, in morality, in health, and in real education. Entire industries thrive on this social disease. The true, true moral values can be devastated through the destroyed familial dynamic due to the lack of proper parenting that ends up being the result. Children raised with little to no moral values will eventually have a different value system grafted upon them by schooling, by mainstream media and popular entertainment, and their peers who have often gone through a similar process of moral degradation. Money will eventually become their only value system in their minds. They're trying to breed out righteous anger through this agenda. Conditioned women are being engineered to reject all forms of the emotion of anger when displayed by a male. From a very early age, they are taught the new age deception that anger is an invalid emotion that human beings, especially men, should not openly display. Of course, 
This tactic is used to suppress righteous indignation toward the iniquities that are taking place in our world so that the powers that be can go on ruling unchallenged. Lincoln said, you, thank you. Lincoln said, you can tell the greatness of a man by what makes him angry. The inauthentic man, man, they're feminizing the human male. The war on authentic men takes the form of the emasculation of the human male, a process which breeds out the sacred masculine dynamic, which is the willingness to stand up to tyrants and bullies with physical self-defensive force if necessary. The long-term agenda is to create a feminized man that will not ever challenge the state and to simultaneously condition women to view the state as an all-powerful husband-slash-father figure. The conditioned woman at a subconscious level chooses the feminized man who will not stand up for himself since her perception has been influenced to see that man as one who is the most suited to survive for the very reason that he will not place himself in danger by challenging the violence of the state. The corporate suit and tie guy is mistakenly seen by the conditioned woman as a man of long-term value because he has money in place of a genuine man that possesses the skill set to thrive in a natural world survival scenario. For example, a man that can survive beyond the corporate or digital world. Most feminized and emasculated men, including most of the corporate suit and tie guys, will most likely be dead on day one in a true survival scenario. I have two more, a couple more slides. They're breeding out the rebels in our society, folks. Rebellion against the state, a reverence for true freedom, and placing high value on personal responsibility and individual rights are traits that are being deliberately bred out of humanity through the epigenetics agenda because such traits are undesirable to the ruling class. Socially engineered traits being bred into the new human include a fear of going against the norm, docility, submissiveness, obedience to authority, and going along to get along, as depicted by the gentleman in this picture. But hey, ladies, he's hot. He loves hot girls. Yeah, that's what a real man looks like right there. You know, when I was looking for images of rebels, you know, that one came up. The three percenters, they're here and they're not going anywhere. And we're taking our rights back. We're not asking for them. They, they were never anybody else's to take. But, you know, the first image I was going to go with here was this one. You know, there's the image of the, the new masculine man. You know, that's, that's Charlie Brown. You know, he got his football back from Lucy, by the way. <laughs> you see the football there? Yeah. Yeah, I got a kick out of that meme on Facebook. Last couple slides. Neo-feminism is a mind control-based eugenics program designed to breed compliant slaves. That's what it's ultimately about, folks. It is designed to perpetuate human slavery. It is designed to eliminate rebels, independent thinkers, and spiritually awake human beings. One of the most fundamental aspects of the program is to influence the vast majority of women to be attracted only to men who are the most fitting to perpetuate the system of human slavery. And that's why we've gone from rebels like the, the American revolutionaries to so-called men like this. No society wants you to become wise. It is against the investment of all societies. If people are wise, they cannot be exploited. If they are intelligent, they cannot be subjugated. They cannot be forced into a mechanical life to live like robots. They will have the fragrance of rebellion all about them. In fact, a wise man is a fire, alive, a flame. He would like rather to die than to be enslaved. <laughs> Folks, the agenda being pushed by neo-feminism is our future if we don't stop it. I'm gonna to end today with a quote from George Orwell's 1984. Do you begin to see then what kind of world we are creating? It is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and treachery, of torment, a world of trampling and being trampled upon, a world which will grow not less but more merciless as it refines itself. Progress in our world will be progress toward more pain. The old civilizations claim that they were founded on love and justice. Ours is founded upon hatred. 
In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph, and self-abasement. Everything else we shall destroy. Everything. Already we are breaking down the habits of thought which have survived from before our revolution. We have cut the links between child and parent. We have cut the links between man and man and between man and woman. No one dares trust a wife or a child or a friend any longer. But in the future, there will be no wives and no friends. Children will be taken from their mothers at birth as one takes eggs from a hen. The sex instinct will be eradicated. Procreation will be an annual formality like the renewal of a ration card. We shall abolish the orgasm. Our neurologists are at work upon it now. There will be no loyalty except loyalty toward the party. There will be no love except the love of Big Brother. Ladies and gentlemen, to see how this may possibly turn out and to hear the solutions I have to present, you'll have to hear me talk tomorrow evening. Thank you for your kind attention. Mark Passio.